Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers right now on Morning News Now. Search and seizure this morning. New information about the FBI search of the Mar-a-Lago estate of former President Donald Trump. What we're learning about a June meeting with Department of Justice officials about records stored there. And now Trump allies more convinced than ever of his intentions in 2024. The one thing I can tell you is that I believed he was going to run before. I'm stronger in my belief now. Also, as Trump supporters rally on the streets and online, there are new concerns of violence. We have full coverage. Prime suspect this morning, an arrest related to a series of killings that's left New Mexico's Muslim community on edge. What we're learning about the man who police say is responsible. Absent, forget skipping class or even taking a gap year. More high schoolers are choosing not to go to college at all. We'll take a closer look at what's behind this shift in mindset when it comes to higher education. And end of an era, tennis superstar Serena Williams saying farewell to the sport she's dominated for decades. Why she's evolving away from the sport in her own words as we look back on her legendary career and what her future may hold. And of course, in doing so, putting out a message so relatable for so many people across the world, even as she's as unrelatable as she may be no in kidding. her success. And I'm excited because we get to talk with a Hall of Fame coach who helped mm. train her. So it's going to be a great conversation. Yeah, it really will. We'll bring you later that hour. We're happy to have you with us today. We're going to get started this morning with that new information we're learning about the FBI search of former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago residence in Florida. NBC News has learned that Trump's legal team was in discussions with the Justice Department as recently as June about presidential records stored at Mar-a-Lago. Christina Bob, one of Trump's attorneys, disclosed those discussions to NBC News. She says she was present during the search on Monday. Bob says the FBI removed about a dozen boxes of documents from a basement storage unit in the search at Mar-a-Lago. She also confirmed that the search warrant left by agents showed they were investigating the potential violation of laws related to the handling of classified material under the Presidential Records Act. We're also learning more about the timeline. Two sources familiar with the matter say that FBI agents arrived at Mar-a-Lago around 9 a.m. on Monday to conduct the search and left around 6.30 at night. These new developments come as Republicans from all across the party rally around the former president. That includes a group of House Republicans who met with Trump at the golf club in Bedminster, New Jersey, last night. NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard is outside of Mar-a-Lago in Florida with the latest. Vaughn, good morning to you. So first, what are we learning about those June meetings that took place between the Justice Department and members of Trump's legal team? Right. Good morning, Joe and Savannah. We are being told that that meeting on June 3rd took place between these Trump lawyers as well as DOJ officials. Uh, this was a meeting that I am told by a source familiar uh, had been in negotiations for a period of time with the Department of Justice, who became interested in these potentially classified documents, these materials that were taken from the White House there in those final days of the Trump administration and brought here to Mar-a-Lago, the place that has since become Donald Trump, the former president's residency. It was there at Mar-a-Lago on June 3rd. The former president was there himself. And I am told that the former president had interactions uh, with the DOJ and even was the one who led him into this specific room to show him where the materials were uh, supposedly remained. There is at least one lock that was on this particular room. Uh, I am told that at that point that Trump himself authorized to have a second lock put on this door. Uh, that is when, again, a uh, source familiar from Trump's side of this says that uh, they had intended to completely comply with the request of of uh, the DOJ, but then that led to ultimately this week, uh, in which the uh, search warrant was executed and multiple boxes of uh, documents and materials were removed from the premises. Now, Vaughn, it looks like the search warrant the FBI agents had was focused on finding those classified documents. And as you just mentioned, we know investigators did, in fact, leave with documents, leave with these boxes. What is Trump's team saying about this search and what was taken? Do we know anything at this point about what those documents are? I, that is a big question. And again, this is from Trump team's understanding. They say they believe this investigation is into, again, the potential materials here and the classification of them. Uh, just take a listen, though, to Christina Bob, one of the lawyers for Trump, who says that she was present there for that June meeting. Take a listen. I don't think that there was actually anything there that's worthwhile. 
Uh, we'll see what they come up with. You know, if they did, it'll be interesting, especially since they precluded me from actually watching what they did. But, but at this point, I don't necessarily think that they would even go to the extent of trying to plant information. I think they just make stuff up and you know come up with whatever they want. And I, I, that's the way that they will have to proceed in order to actually try to indict the president because they, they don't have anything. There, there's just nothing there. And I think that it is very, very important to note there, uh, not only did Christina Bob suggest the planting of material by uh, a preeminent uh, law enforcement agency in the United States of America, but just in the last 10 minutes, Donald Trump himself put out a statement in which he suggested that perhaps the same, that perhaps there was planting. And I think it, that needs to come with all of the caveats here, is that neither of these individuals, the former president or his lawyer, have presented any evidence to suggest that that would take place, and this is a further effort to undermine faith in America's law enforcement agencies, uh, and that at this point here, in order to get this actual search warrant, that the Department of Justice would have had to go to a federal judge to seek approval with pro that, uh, that there was probable cause of a crime. Of course, the judge approved that. Now the next step of this is to go forward with the execution of the search warrant, which they did, and continue the investigation, and ultimately it will be at that time whether the Department of Justice were to uh, indict the former president or other individuals. Vaughn, so we are seeing members of the Republican Party come to Trump's defense so far. Looking at the reaction so far in the last couple days, if Trump runs for president again, does it seem like the FBI search is going to strengthen his support within the party or, or could it weaken it? You know, I was talking with a source familiar who had had a conversation with uh, Donald Trump himself yesterday afternoon and said that they were uh, very happy with the outpouring of support and defense from Republicans at large across this party. I mean, not only did the likes of Ron DeSantis, but also even Mike Pence coming out with statements supporting the former president and calling into question the actions of the Department of Justice and demanding that the Department of Justice lay out its reasoning for uh, executing the search warrant uh, at such a high level against the former president here. Uh, but when you look at the responses across the board, this comes at a time in which we're less than three months until the midterm elections here. And Donald Trump has openly talked about running for president and announcing uh, his campaign before, uh, before November, within the next three months here. And so they view this as an opportunity to turn it on its head and, again, make Donald Trump the political martyr here, somebody who is being attacked by the political opposition. Yet again, though, we must reiterate the fact is that there is no evidence that has been presented by Donald Trump or his allies to suggest that this was some sort of uh, political opposition effort here, and this will ultimately play out uh, within the Department of Justice. Von Hillier near Mar-a-Lago. Von, thank you so much. Thank you. Today, President Biden is expected to sign the Bipartisan Pact Act, the latest victory in what has been a major month so far for the White House's agenda. That bill expands life-saving health care benefits for veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, those who were exposed to toxic burn pits while deployed. The legislation passed overwhelmingly in the Senate last week by a vote of 86 to 11 after it had been recently blocked by some Republicans. Joining us now is NBC News White House correspondent Carol so, Carol, this is a major win for those veterans who fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. It did not come easy. Remind us why there was a little bit of pushback against this bill last week. And then looking ahead, what does the president have planned for the signing today? Sure, Joe. Well, it, this is something that has had bipartisan support for a very long time. What happened was there was a hiccup after Democrats had that this bill on the Inflation Reduction Act. Republicans then said that they weren't going to support this bill because of some technical funding issue that they said was in it. Nothing had really changed. There was a big public pressure campaign on Republicans to reverse course, and they did, and it passed, ultimately, with that overwhelming bipartisan support that you just mentioned. Now, what the bill does, it expands health care eligibility for more than 3.5 million veterans who were exposed to toxins, and it also makes it easier for them to qualify for VA services. And it also has there's a, this list of 23 conditions, including some rest respiratory conditions, and it cuts a lot of the red tape, a lot of the paperwork that's required for those who have these conditions to receive care. It also doesn't just deal with those who've been exposed to burn pits and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's, it's more than that. It's things like those who've been exposed to Agent Orange, those who've served in other war zones who may have been exposed to other sorts of toxins. And a large chunk of this bill also 
Joe goes to research on, on these sort of toxins and how people serving overseas in the military might become close to them and what the effects of that are. Now, one thing to look for in the president's bill signing, which he'll do around 10 a.m. at the White House, surrounded by a number of cabinet officials and others, is this is something that's very personal to him. We've heard the president talk about his late son, Bo, who served in Iraq, had, that he had exposure to burn pits and that he had died of brain cancer. The president often makes that link there and talks about how personal this is to him and his family, Joe. Carol, this all also comes on the heels of President Biden signing into law the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act just yesterday. Remind us, what's in that bill? What does that accomplish? And what's the White House saying about the signing there? Well, this is a bill that the White House says is designed to boost manufacturing here at home, particularly when it comes to technology. It's another bipartisan accomplishment by the president that he's, he's talking about and, and going to tell. And so what it does is it invests a lot of money, billions, and do, billions of dollars, $52 billion in subsidies for companies that have that, that do this sort of manufacturing, another billions and billions of dollars more and just in investing in the, in the research and, th and development and things like that. And the president is casting this as a bill that will create jobs here at, in the U.S. Take a listen to what he said. Folks, we need to make these chips here in America to bring down everyday costs and create jobs. Don't take my word for it. Listen to some of the business leaders here today and across the country. They're making decisions right now about where to invest and ramp up production for these semiconductors. Many are foreigners making investments, companies making deciding where in the world to go, and they've chosen <coughs> the United States of America. This, again, is another legislative achievement the president's had. A string of those lately expect him to talk about this, among others, while out there campaigning for those midterm elections. The issue here, Joe, is that this is not necessarily something that Americans are going to feel. There's a lot of economic concern out there. That's still people's top concern heading into these elections. And this is a bill that's really designed for the longer term. All right. Carol Lee, appreciate it. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks. We turn now to a story that has left New Mexico's Muslim community frightened and in mourning. A man was taken into custody last night as the prime suspect for the killings of four Muslim men. NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas has the latest on this story. Police say they've arrested 51-year-old Muhammad Siad, identified as the primary suspect in the recent killings of four Muslim men in Albuquerque. A tip from the community is what helped us lead us to this subject and what helped us eventually find the car that we put out just two days ago. Authorities said an interpersonal conflict may have led to the shootings. Syed is being charged with two homicides, the killings of Aftab Hussein and Muhammad of Sal Hussein. We knew Albuquerque would step up and somebody would find and identify that vehicle for us, which is exactly what happened. The four killings taking place on different evenings in this section of the city, three of them in the last two weeks. On Sunday, authorities released a photo of the suspect's car, pleading for the public's help and adding a $20,000 reward for information. Today's news, little comfort for Sharif Hadi, the brother of victim Mohammed Sayyir Ahmadi. Everybody's coming to me and they're crying for him. If you lost somebody, you better get it back. The latest victim, 25-year-old Naeem Hussein, who was found dead Friday night, just hours after attending the funerals of two of the other murder victims, Muhammad Asfal Hussein and Aftab Hussein, all three originally from Pakistan. All right, Guad Venegas, thank you for that report. Let's get a check on your morning news now weather. And Bill Karens is with us this morning. Bill, good morning. Good morning. Great to see you guys. Look, I even got a little pink on. My daughter made me a pink bracelet. <laughs> I, I got my wrist. We're good to go. <laughs> and you brought Aye. cool weather, too. Yeah. Cool weather here yeah, in the Northeast. Down. Oh, wow, God. what a treat, Bill. I know. I'm back and everything's just, you know, roses and sunshine. Um, unfortunately for some people, though, it's not quite as nice as that. So let's get into our flash flood risk for today. That's kind of the problem kind of over the last three weeks besides the heat. Um, obviously, what happened in Kentucky and then the flash flooding we had in Maryland and Denver and Death Valley this past weekend. And we do have a chance of seeing similar scenarios later on today. The biggest heads up, of course, is going to be for areas of Kentucky that are under, you know, a slight risk of flash flooding and Washington, D.C. Those two areas 
areas have been hit a couple times over the last couple of weeks. The soil is saturated. Right now, we're fine. There's not a lot on radar. It's typical afternoon stuff, and we're under a flash flood watch. It goes from that area of eastern Kentucky, almost all of West Virginia, and then into the Charlottesville, Fredericksburg, Washington, D.C., Baltimore area. Again, this is a lot of hilly areas, and you get the central Appalachians, and historically, that's where we've seen a lot of really bad flash floods in our country's history. So I paused our radar at 6 p.m. and noticed that big red blotch there near Washington, D.C. That's the indication, at least the potential, for a lot of heavy rain on the I-95 corridor from D.C. southwards to Fredericksburg and approaching Richmond. And then if we track that back through West Virginia and areas of Kentucky, isolated strong storms there, too. So keep an eye on that. Then the front pushes to the south. Some drier, cooler air works in. I think on Thursday in areas from Kentucky to D.C., we're going to be just fine. So how much rain could we get? There's the possibility of one to two, three inches in isolated cases. And that's what this is going to be, isolated flash flooding. So the forecast for today, and as Joe and Savannah were hinting at, everyone from about New York City northwards through New England and the Ohio Valley, all full of smiles. Look at St. Louis, 83 degrees. After the summer you have had, that is gold. Uh, Chicago, 84. Enjoy Enjoy your lunch outside today is about as nice as it gets for the middle of August. It's still hot and humid in other areas. And, of course, coming up next hour, as Savannah requests on every Wednesday, you will have your weekend forecast. All right. All right there we go. We love the weekend forecast tease, Bill, as always, on Wednesdays from you. I know. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. See you in a bit. Right, great to see you guys. Welcome back. Let's get to some international headlines now, starting with breaking news out of Crimea, where a series of explosions rocked a Russian military airbase this morning. Now speculation is growing that it could be a missile attack by Ukraine. NBC's Morgan Chesky joined us now from Zaporizhia in southeastern Ukraine. Morgan, good morning. Yeah, Joseph, Anna, good morning. We know one person is dead, at least 12 others injured after this strike on a military base on the Black Sea in the Russian-controlled area of Crimea. And we've seen multiple videos from social media that show smoke filling the skies. They're capturing loud booms and people running from flames and the smoke at that scene. Russian officials say the airbase was not shelled and that the blasts were caused by detonated ammunition. But a Ukrainian official says the blasts were either caused by Ukrainian-made long-range weapons or were the work of Ukrainian allies operating in Crimea. And now to the Dominican Republic, where two miners have been rescued after being trapped in a cave for 10 days. More than 100 experts from as far away as Canada were part of this massive rescue effort. The miners were finally rescued through a newly dug tunnel and were greeted by Dominican President Luis Abinader. The two were then flown by helicopter to receive much-needed medical care. Finally, to Italy, the birthplace of pizza, where Domino's is apparently giving up on trying to win over the locals. Bloomberg reports the fast food giant has now closed the last of its 29 stores in Italy. Domino's first arrived there back in 2015 with the plan of winning customers over with deliverable pizza. But when the pandemic lockdown hit, all the local pizzerias turned to delivery, <laughs> increasing their competition. So far, Domino's has not commented on the report, but guys, after looking at the results here, sounds an awful lot like the Italian locals are simply telling Domino's, arrivederci. <laughs> we'll send it back to you. That is hilarious that they even tried to make that work. I, yep, and, <laughs> and probably I won't again. I love Domino's, but come on, in Italy. <laughs> yeah, no. Pros, absolutely. Yeah. All, right. All right, Morgan, thanks so much. So as the war in Ukraine approaches the six-month mark, the humanitarian crisis there is showing no signs of slowing down. The U.N.'s refugee agency says nearly one-third of Ukrainians have fled their homes since the war began, with over 6.6 .6 million people displaced within the country. And nonprofits like KidSave are working around the clock to help evacuate families caught up in the conflict. Randy Thompson is the CEO of KidSave, and she joins us now. Randy, thank you so much for being here with us. Thanks for your time this morning. First, we just want to hear about the type of work that you're doing in Ukraine, what's it like, how you're doing it, and how many people have you been able to help? Right now in Ukraine, we're doing rescue and humanitarian. Uh, we were in Ukraine to do child placement um, into families out of orphanages, but when the war hit, we got a call from our program people that said, I have 117 children that we just placed into families. We have to get them out of danger because this was in Mykolaiv and Kherson, where the Russians attacked first. So we quickly mobilized and got a group in with, you know, sort of a ragtag team, um, got those 117 kids to safety in the villages. So we didn't move them out of Ukraine. Within a day, we realized that I wasn't going to be good enough. <laughs> and we began an effort to 
get vans and trucks and cargo vans and we started buying sprinters and developed a convoy of 66 drivers you know six convoys going out to all the regions when people were frightened and ready to leave today we've rescued almost 24,000 people wow. out of those regions and because the people are displaced we're feeding nearly 35,000 people each week mm. so it's a lot of people um, there's the need is so much greater you know as mm. as the Ukrainian story goes off the headlines yeah um, the need is just going up 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 so we're in a position where you know we're trying to still do the child welfare work that we came into Ukraine to do to help children live in families. But first and foremost, now you got to keep people safe. You got to keep them fed. You got to keep them alive. So, you know, you live to fight the other day. I mean, mm -hmm. you're doing this in a war zone. How do you keep people safe, keep people fed? What are the biggest challenges? Well, um, first we had to get our vehicles, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then we had to armor vehicles. <laughs> I mean, these are all things that yeah. as a you know, child welfare permanency person were new to me. But, yeah. um, you know, it's like almost starting a new not-for-profit as you're learning this. But, uh, you know, we had to get armor for our team. We had to get, you know, helmets and ballistics, gas masks, all the things that they need to be able to go in. And then you have to learn how to source the food. And, you know, the knee-jerk reaction is to get everything from the U.S., but that is absolutely wrong because... It costs a lot, and some things you have to get from the U.S., like, just the quality for tourniquets and things like that. But we are getting as much as we can from Ukraine so that we can bore up, you know, way up the economy there as well for those people who can work, because so many are not able to. Absolutely. And again, just, I mean, the fact that the work you went in to do, and now these are people who have to be wearing armor and helmets. Exactly. I mean, what do you need right now? What help can people provide who are listening? What is it that would be helpful to your organization? Yeah, we need uh, everything. Everything's <laughs> needed right now. Um, as we look to the fall, um, you know, we know we need generators. We know we need cooking things because they've blown out all the electrical. We need to just keep supplying. You know, if there's we're feeding 35,000 a week, and they have territorial people tell us we need to feed 105,000. Mm. We need to continue to raise money. I mean, it's, I know people like to get in there and give, you know, give stuff mm. because that makes them feel really good, but we really need the donations to come in so that we can purchase the, the things to get to them and so that people in Ukraine can have a business that they sell those things. You know, it's really long term if you have you know Ukraine was two and a half million people uh, below the poverty line mm. last year and they're projecting that it could be 50 people 50 million you know 50 percent of the people wow. at the poverty line next year so everything we're doing even as we're looking at humanitarian aid we want to think about how do you get it into Ukraine so Ukrainians who are there can work and the Ukrainians want to work you know they don't want to just sit there and wait mm -hmm. for the bombs yeah. I have a volunteer who was helping us to distribute food, and she said, thank you for giving me something to do other than wait for, you know, under the bunker. Wow. So, you know, you're giving people purpose and keeping them feeling yeah. like things are yeah. are happening. And helping their economy, which, of course, needs it. Right. Randy yeah. Thompson, thank you so much. Incredible work that you're doing. We appreciate your time this morning and letting us know how we can help. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for Good having to you. me. Welcome back. With the end of summer, sadly, just around the corner, many no. students around the country, yeah, they're getting ready to go to college. <laughs> but it turns out a growing number of high school grads are now deciding to opt out of higher education. It's the subject of a new article in the Heckinger Report. For more, we're joined by the higher education editor at the Heckinger Report and author of that article, John Marcus. John, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. So in your article, you wrote, policymakers are grappling with an alarming decline in the number of high school graduates willing to invest the time and money it takes to go to college. What did you find was the reason or the reasons behind the shift? So, so common wisdom has it that it's because of the pandemic, which was obviously demoralizing to this generation of potential college students, that it's the uh, decline in the number of 18-year-olds because of birth, birth rate fluctuations, which is true. There, there are fewer 18-year-olds. And also because the labor market is so good. But if you look more deeply, what we're finding is that there's 
growing skepticism among Americans um, about the value of a degree and whether it's worth the escalating price. So what are the long-term consequences of a drop in college enrollment then? Right. So there are consequences for individuals who choose not to go to college, uh, people with bachelor's degrees, whether they believe it's worth the money or not. People with bachelor's degrees actually make over their lifetimes about 67 percent more uh, than people who don't go to college. More generally for the economy, there's a huge impact on uh, the economy because we're running out of educated workers. There was even before the pandemic a shortage estimated to be of about 9 million um, uh, college-educated workers. In a knowledge economy, that's a big problem, and our economic rivals worldwide have increased the proportion of their population going to college, whereas in the United States, it's declining very, very quickly. So, of course, the cost of this four-year degree has obviously been a hot issue for years now, but there's also these other reasons that you're referencing. What are colleges and universities doing to try to win over students who aren't sure that it's worth it? How are they trying to get kids in the door? Well, frankly, they're not doing much. And a lot of the problem with college going is universities and colleges' own fault. Uh, if you look at focus groups and survey data, Students say it's too confusing to understand financial aid. Some of the states where the decline is greatest in the number of high school graduates going on to college are places like Tennessee and Indiana, which have extremely generous financial aid programs. So even if you really do think it's the cost, there are ways to kind of go to college at an affordable or manageable price. Um, so colleges advertise a price that almost no one really pays. Uh, called the sticker price, but after discounts in financial aid, very few students actually pay that. They pay about half of that in general. So these long-term policies and the, the escalating price of college uh, that's been going on forever, finally, I think we've gotten to the breaking point where students and their families are saying no. And one really interesting thing that we unearthed during this writing of this story is these kids' parents are still paying off their college loans. And so they're now oh. less um, uh, enthusiastic about sending their kids to college, putting their own their own kids through that same level of debt. Wow, that says something right there when your 18-year-old yeah. is uh, going to school and you're still paying off your totally. debt right there. I mean, th the big question really at the center of this is, does a college degree pay off? You already mentioned one of those numbers around folks who have a bachelor degree, but what do the numbers tell us? What are you finding in your research? Yeah, so uh, during economic downturns, uh, including at the start of the pandemic, and there's a lot of suggestion that we're heading to another one, people with bachelor's degrees are much less likely to lose their jobs. Uh, there, there are also other advantages to college going. Uh, again, if you look at empirical research, people that go to college make more money, so they pay more taxes. Uh, people that don't go to college, therefore, pay less money in taxes require more social services. So again, it's kind of a drag on the economy. All right, John Marcus, very interesting look. Mm -hmm. We appreciate you joining us this morning to delve into the issue. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. And turning now to a silent struggle some Americans face every single day. Up to 60% of people suffering from substance abuse disorders relapse, according to one of the nation's top medical journals. NBC News Now anchor Aaron Gilchrist traveled to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where he spoke to one veteran on a mission to stop relapse in its tracks. As a little girl, Sharina Johnson wanted to be just like her dad. My father, he was in the military. I liked his confidence. I liked his uniform. Nine Alpha cannot be your spouse. So she followed in her dad's footsteps and enlisted in the Army Reserve. In 2005, Sharina bottled her fear, and at just 20 years old, she deployed to Iraq. Battles raged across that country leading up to Saddam Hussein's October trial. More than 800 American service members died in Iraq that year. Once we got there, more fear because now you're hearing bombs. <laughs> now you're hearing gunshots far away. This is not something that you really are prepared for. I did not know at the time, but I was struggling with PTSD. Back on American soil, she relived her trauma. Fourth of July, it's a lot of fireworks. I have a very uneasy feeling where it's like, if I'm in that space, it sounds like bombs. Just being hyper alert, uh, very vigilant, always uh, in an aggressive manner. How did you try to deal with that? How did you try to cope with it? So I self-medicated. Um, that was my coping skill, just self-medicating it with um, drugs and alcohol. 
As Sharina struggled with substance abuse, her life fell apart. She lost her job and her home. Sharina's return to civilian life was not unique. According to the National Institutes of Health, more than one in 10 veterans who seek care at the VA meet the criteria to be diagnosed with substance abuse disorder. And the Department of Veterans Affairs says more than 20% of veterans with PTSD also have a substance abuse disorder. You're taught to be a warrior, you're taught to be a killer. So you don't think about, okay, I have these anger issues now, how do I cope with it? Sharina found her way to rehab, months of structure, therapy, and support to fight her addiction. In treatment, I felt like, yes, I can do this. But once I left treatment and hit the real world, I felt lost again. Almost immediately, she relapsed. As soon as I got out, um, I felt alone. Today, Sharina is drug-free and turning her struggle into entrepreneurship. She's made it her mission to help others avoid relapsing too. Her idea is the Arcana Recovery Smartphone app. It connects struggling addicts to local therapists and counselors. It also tracks mood and aims to stop relapse in its tracks with artificial intelligence. It's a lot of people that um, struggle with addiction um, are usually disconnected from people. So reconnecting people with people that they can relate to or that believe in them is definitely uh, important for people's recovery. Successful entrepreneurs. Arcana is still in its beta phase, but Sharina's mentor believes her life experience can take the company to the next level. The passion was already there because it was very personal. That, that's something you can't fake. Jay Jayamohan runs the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Harrisburg University. Right now, he's helping Sharina navigate the process of raising money for her company. There are great ideas in a little town like Harrisburg, and maybe we should pay attention there. Don't come expecting the typical looking founder, but there are incredibly cool people doing really great things here and solving problems that are really needed. These days, Sharina is busy pitching her app to venture capital firms. She has seed money and is working with organizations that help addicts in their recovery. When I was homeless, um, I would come out to the water and sip out of water because we're very common. An ever-flowing reminder of what's possible for people working through recovery and for herself. It's vast. There's many opportunities out there. It's endless. It can break through any barrier. Uh, it overcomes things. Oh, such an important tool for our men and women who need it most. Of course, thank you to all our veterans for their service and our thanks to Aaron Gilchrist for that report. We're back with an NBC News exclusive, the first cameras ever allowed inside U.S. Space Command. That's where the military tracks every rocket and missile launch anywhere in the world. And NBC News has learned that commanding generals are very concerned about a new spy satellite that Russia has placed in the same orbit and right beneath an orbiting U.S. satellite. NBC News co correspondent Tom Costello has the story. Zero. Ignition. Liftoff of L-87. Go, Falcon. Go, go. February 2nd in California, SpaceX launched a classified government satellite into orbit, NROL-87. Stage separation confirmed. Believed to be a top-secret, state-of-the-art spy satellite that the Pentagon says will support its overhead reconnaissance mission. Also watching that launch, Moscow. And just last week, Russia launched its own spy satellite, Cosmo 2558, placing it in the same orbit and just beneath the U.S. satellite. That's really irresponsible behavior. In an exclusive interview with NBC News, Space Command, four-star General James Dickinson, says Russia may be trying to get an up-close look at U.S. spy capabilities. We see that it's in a similar orbit to one of our high value assets for the US government. And so we'll continue like we always do to continue to update that and track that. This is the US Spacecom Jock with an operation and limit to Fender Conference. All conferees respond when pulled. Last week, our cameras were the first ever allowed inside the Space Command Joint Operations Center in Colorado Springs. It's at the, uh, the zenith, the very top of our space operations centers within the Department of Defense where the U.S. watches and tracks every missile and rocket launch anywhere in the world. 
From the war in Ukraine to Chinese military exercises off Taiwan to that Russian satellite launch. How quickly do they learn that something has launched somewhere in the world? We have some really good space capabilities today that will tell us almost immediately if there's been a launch. Longitude 80 degrees, 36 minutes west. This is the newest infrared satellite used to detect the heat signatures from any missile or rocket launch anywhere in the world. This is half scale. The real satellite is about the size of a school bus. Russia has uh, a similar capability with its own satellites. International satellite trackers say it's no coincidence that Russia launched its rocket at the very moment the U.S. spy satellite passed over the Russian launch site. There is a, a part of the, the current new Cold War is also going on in space. So it, it, it's basically part of this, this cat and mouse game uh, that's going on in space. In a show of force last November, Russia blew up one of its own orbiting satellites. And we continue today to track almost 1,500 pieces of debris from that uh, incident and that test event that they did. A new Cold War moving from the ground to space. Tom Costello, NBC News, Colorado Springs. Now let's get you some financial headlines, and Google may soon be facing another lawsuit by the Justice Department. It's NBC's Courtney Reagan joins us with that and other money news. Hey, Courtney, good morning. Good morning. The Justice Department is expected to file an antitrust lawsuit against Google as soon as next month over its dominance in online advertising. Bloomberg reports the suit is coming after the government rejected concessions by Google, including an offer to split off its ad business. In 2020, the Justice Department sued Google for its monopoly in the search market, alleging it favors its own search results over the competition. Amazon's palm scanning technology is expanding to more Whole Foods stores, this time in California. More than 60 locations will offer the payment service, allowing customers to pay with a scan of their hand. The checkup devices were introduced in 2020, and several Whole Foods have already been testing them in Los Angeles, Austin, Seattle, and New York. Customers can set up their account by registering their palm print using a kiosk or point of sale station at a participating store. And Spotify is reorganizing the app to better separate content between music and podcasts. The new home feed, which is rolling out now for Android users and will be coming to iOS in the near future, doesn't look much different than the current layout. There are two new buttons at the top of the screen, one for music and one for podcasts and shows. The music tab will show you suggestions based on your listening history, while podcasts and shows will display the latest episodes of your favorite shows and recommendations for new ones. Back over to you. All right, very cool. Thank yeah, you, Courtney. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. And now it's time for our weekly roundup of medical news. And in addition to the impact of climate change on the planet, it may have more of an impact on your health than you previously thought. Yeah, that's according to a recently published study that links global warming to a rise in infectious diseases. NBC News senior medical correspondent Dr. John Torres is with us again today. Dr. John, always great to have you with us. So before we actually get to those stories, we want to get to the latest on monkeypox. And I understand that we're switching some things up with the vaccine here to try to be able to get it to more people. Tell us about this. So they just gave an emergency use authorization to give it a different way. Instead of giving it in the upper arm like they normally get vaccines, they're doing this one under the skin in the forearm, most likely, if you've ever gotten a tuberculosis test like that. The reason they're doing this is they found out through a study that they can actually give one-fifth of the dose. So now instead of having just 400,000 doses, they have over 2 million which hopefully can wow. help tackle the problem. That's a big difference. Yeah, let's get to some other health headlines, including that thing we tease. There's this large study in the Nature Climate Change Journal shows climate hazards, so heat waves, intense flooding, they can actually worsen infectious yeah. diseases. It like is, that. and this is a big wake-up call, I think, for everybody about climate change. It's not just your house, it's not just your environment, it's your health as well. And probably the most surprising thing when I saw this is that there's 375 infectious diseases out there. I didn't know there were that many. 218 of those seem to be affected by climate change, the 558% there. And they're made worse because of the extreme weather we have out there. And what they did is a study connected this thousand pathways to different climate hazards and to sick people and the illnesses they have. And the five transmission routes they looked at there, vector-borne, which are mosquitoes, insects, that type of thing, waterborne, foodborne, airborne, and then direct contact, like you're seeing right now with monkeypox, that direct contact type of situation. So what are the doctor's orders? What can you do about this? Because this is climate change we're talking about. Well, number one, do your part. You know, we used to say save the elephants, and now we need to save ourselves as well. And so you need to make sure that wow. you're doing your part to help out with the climate change here. And then keep as healthy as you can. And that means, number one, stay up to date with your vaccines, work out, 
eat well, all those things that really help because it's coming. Yeah. Oof. All right, Dr. John, this next one is on tinnitus, which actually I understand is something that you suffer from. It's a study from Italian researchers that shows 14% of the world's population experiences it. Tell us a little bit about this, about your experience and what this study found. So, yeah, I have tinnitus myself, and it's from my days in the Air Force being a pilot. The engine noise is just, after a while, it's just chronic yeah. accumulation of noise, and it can damage your hearing. It can damage your ears. You get this ringing or roaring in your ears or sometimes whooshing, and it can be very, very annoying and debilitating for some people. Well, it turns out more than 700 and 40 million people around the world have tinnitus, and that can go anywhere again from mild all the way up to severe, where it can be debilitating. And even, you know, some people have even contemplated suicide or uh, unfortunately have had died by suicide because of this. But this includes 10% of young adults, 14% of middle aged adults, and 24% of older adults. Now, the young adults, they can't say, okay, there's less of us because it's cumulative. And so by the time they get to the older adult range, there'll be even more problems. So, what can you do? What are the doctor's orders? Well, number one, earbuds are very concerned. If you talk to an audi audiologist right now, they'll tell you they're concerned about the generations now that are using earbuds because 30 years from now, they're probably going to have tinnitus or hearing issues. So, Here's a little rule of thumb. The person standing next to you should not be able to hear what you're listening to on your earbuds. That means they're too loud, so turn them down. If you're out and about in an environment where it's noisy, like New York City, try noise canceling without the music, just the noise canceling headphones or earbuds themselves. Mm -hmm. And remember, time and intensity cause that damage. And so the more time you spend at loud noises, the more intense that noise is, the more damage you're going to get, and it builds up over time. Mm -hmm. Helpful advice there. Yeah. All right, so we cover all kinds of topics here, including bouncy houses. Some parents may actually have a legitimate fear that their kid could blow away in a bouncy house. And, and a new study shows that there, there might be some reality. There is some reality that. to this, and bouncy houses can be a lot of fun. And first and foremost, they can be tons of fun. You just need to make sure you do it correctly. The reason is, since 2000, there have unfortunately been 479 people injured in bouncy houses, and more, worst case, 28 have died since 2000 in bouncy houses wow. because either the house took off or a house landed on them type of situation. So right now, if you look at it, again, those are the numbers there. There are an estimated 10,000 ER visits a year because of bounce houses and injuries that occur in bounce houses. And a slight breeze, when they went through the chart and they did all the different conditions that happened when these bounce houses caused injuries, Eight miles an hour, in some cases, was enough of a wind to cause it to go and blow away. So what can you do? Well, first and foremost, number one, you want to keep an eye on the bouncy house. So treat it like you would a pool. Have essentially a lifeguard, an adult there to watch. If the winds start kicking up, it's not just enough to pull somebody out of the bounce house. You have to deflate it as well because it could take off and injure somebody that way. And then make sure that the setup is serious. If you rent a bouncy house, talk to the people who rent it to you about how to set it up, how to anchor it down, how to make sure you keep an eye on it because you want them to have fun, but you want them to be safe as well. All right. Well, that's a nightmare. The whole thing. <laughs> I mean, I think You're I'll not just not. One now, I think are you? I'll just not. Yeah. <laughs> I like the top of our graphic batten down the bouncy house. Hey, just, just keep an eye on the weather. Yeah. Just, yeah. Good. For it's real. All right. Too. Yeah. It's really good advice, though. Dr. John, thank you so much. You Always great to have you with us. Welcome back. The host for this year's Emmy Awards ceremony is drum roll, please. Yeah, it's none other than <laughs> Kenan Thompson. The 20-season SNL alum has been tapped to helm the big show. Well, this will be the Emmy-winning actor's first time hosting this show. It's not his first go at being an MC. He hosted last year's People's Choice Awards and June's NHL Awards. The three-hour show will air Monday, September 12th on NBC. It'll be streamed live on Peacock for the first time as well. We say three hours, but the odds of it actually running three hours are probably very yeah. slim. <laughs> I love Unless he keeps it on top. Yeah. So, Love Keenan. That's yeah. fun. He'll be great. Yeah, Good he'll choice. be awesome. Yeah, very exciting. All right, moving on to some sports news. After nearly 30 years as a pro, tennis great Serena Williams says she will retire from the sport following this year's U.S. Open here in New York. Yeah, that's right. The soon-to-be 41-year-old announced her decision yesterday in Vogue magazine, saying, quote, These days, if I have to choose between building my tennis resume and building my family, I choose the latter. Speaking of that resume, Williams has been nearly untouchable throughout her career. Get this, 73 career singles titles, 23 career doubles titles. Here's the big one, 23 grand slam titles. That's just one short of Margaret Court's all-time record. Joining us now to discuss William's storied career and legacy is Hall of Fame tennis coach Rick Macy, who's actually trained both Serena and Venus Williams. Rick, we are so, so cool. thrilled to have you with us. I mean, you know from your time working with the sisters, Serena's resume is certainly one to beat. Can you tell us more about her journey getting to this point in her career? And do you think... There could possibly be another player, an icon like her ever again or no? 
Well, first off, it's great to be with you. Uh, when I went out to Compton in 1991 and saw Venus and Serena for the first time, I didn't see it at first. But once we said game on and they started competing, I saw something that I've never seen in two little kids. There was a burning desire. There was a mm. rage like no other. And right then and there, I went up to Richard, and this actually is in the movie. I said, listen, you got the next female Michael Jordan on your hands. Mm. And he puts his arm around me. He goes, no, brother, man, I got the next two. I just <laughs> saw something under the hood. And uh, you know, I went on the record. Serena was the best athlete I ever coached at 11. She had all the time in the world, a lot of intangibles, but a lot of people couldn't see it. But uh, she's a special young lady. Absolutely. Yeah, I was just going to say, you, I, what you're saying sounds like you're also in the movie. So there you go. Not even just our coach. So that's pretty <laughs> cool. People definitely know that character. Rick, you know, a lot of fans had hoped, as Joe just mentioned, that she would beat Margaret Quartz's all-time record of Grand Slam titles. If she wasn't Stepping back, if she wasn't, you know, as she said, they're focusing on her family, maybe expanding her family. Do you think she could have done that? Well, probably not now, simply because she needs to play more. You know, you lose a little bit of the movement. Remember, she didn't play every Grand Slam, you know, during her pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she had a few other issues. And But it's not really about her breaking all the records. I mean, she's, in my opinion, not only the greatest female tennis player, ever to hold a racket. I think she's the greatest female athlete of all time. And I tell people that because she's at the top of Mount Rushmore, not only because of the speed and the quickness and the firepower, but what's inside. And when I say Mount Rushmore, uh, she made more opponents rush more than usual. So at the end of the day, uh, this is a very, very unique athlete, generational and, uh, it might be very difficult for someone to duplicate what Serena has done. Mm. Uh, you redefined Mount Rushmore there. I like that. Yeah, Mount uh, Rushmore. What, how did she change tennis, do you think? First off, great question. You know, I think that's her biggest legacy. She brought in, and Venus, you know, the whole African-American community. And she inspired so many young people. But it's not even tennis. If you think of the story, you know, growing up in Compton, Compton having nothing, until I came into the picture at age nine. And just the story, you know, if I can do it, you can do it. It's so inspirational, uh, but her determination, her competitiveness, she's the most brutal competitor. And I've had a lot, you know, I've had five number ones in the world and eight grand cents. She's the most brutal competitor ever, but what she has shown through determination, grit and fiber uh, is like no other. Rick Macy, thank you so much. It was so great to hear your perspective yeah. upon this big news. I know you're wishing Serena all the best in this as she closes out one chapter of her life and moves on to the next. And by the way, the way that she did it and how she called out, you know, what she is dealing with as a woman specifically, I think it made a lot of people feel understood at home. So incredible. Well, it's really she amazing. She won her first Grand Slam at the U.S. Open, and she's going to end it at the U.S. Open. So what a storybook ending. I love it. Absolutely. Great. Thank okay. you. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.